thanks everybody for being here. I think uh, you know most people know each other, so <laughs> I'm not going to introduce everybody. But uh, Philippe Genera, of course, needs no introduction at all. Um, speaking about the landscape of Taver innovation. All right. So uh, thank you so much for uh, Paul having me. It's a it's a great course, and I'm excited. It's my first time here. Um, and I have to apologize because I, can't, I think I'm the only one wearing a tie. I didn't get the memo, but uh, I promise I'm going to have my black T-shirt like Dave Cohen uh, for the next session. Um, so I, I was asked to talk briefly about the landscape of Taver Innovation, and I had to pick a couple of great innovation. There's so many is a, a, a booming field, so we're going to touch um, a little bit on each of them some specific one more in detail, and I'm sure the session will, will touch more deeply on, on some of them. Um, so the way I'm, I approach this is I took the TAVR procedure and go to each, you know, the access, each steps, and access closure, wire pacing, leaf flap modification, which I think is a huge team um, and very exciting, and novel valve technology that are coming along, along the way. Uh, I'm going to start with the access. This is a, a technology which is probably three or four years old. Uh, it's called the early bird. It's a sheet with sensor to detect bleeding, uh, which is a very good for um, large bore catheter and it's FDA approved. The concept here, uh, the, the, the founder thought that it would be, it's an EP guy, and, and the same way that when the pacemaker lead detect a tamponade or, 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 or perforation, you can do that for the vessel. So he put two set of electrodes and kind of cross talk to each other, and the goal was to detect bleeding during procedure. And it's really the signal, it's, it's, it's the new science here where when you have bleeding, this is a sheet, the vein or, or the artery, a six and eight French, and when there's a oozing around or bleeding, there's a drop of bioimpedance, and you can detect bleeding. That's the concept, and this is the bleed signature and there's a lot of animal work that's been done there, injecting blood in the retro, the access, and you have a, a relationship between the drop and impedance of the, the, the amount of blood in the retro or, or the cavity. So new concept of detecting bleeding uh, that could be good for large bore catheters such as Impella or, 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 or very large uh, TMVR uh, um, procedure. We did, we run actually a study of 60 patients, mainly was TAVR, and we compared the rate of bleeding, oozing at the growing site with CT scan and this device, and there was a very good uh, um, a correlation uh, with a Cohen Kappa of 0.84. Very good level of agreement between the two reads, so that, that was a win for them. And now we're almost done with running this study, actually called SAFE MCS study, which is all the Ampella iris PCI, we put a bird next to it. It's like a companion sheet next to the Ampella, and the goal is to reduce bleeding events. So I think that's a, that's a great uh, technology to reduce and improve safety. We'll see how this is going to pan out if we reduce bleeding uh, with, with this, uh, this sheet. The other one that um, I, I, I really love and I use on every case is the Opsense Savvy wire. It's a three, two, three in one wire where you can deliver the valve and you have actually, you can pace and at the tips like an FFR, you can have the gradient real time. And Paul did a great case uh, yesterday, a recorded case. Uh, 035 wire, a little stiffer than a Safari, less than a Confida. Actually stiffer than Confida, a little less than a, a, a Safari. Uh, Pre-shape. Two size, small, extra small, uh, and you can, it's a unipolar uh, pacing. Um, usually the threshold is around two, so just crank up the pacemaker at 20 when you pace. Uh, and um, very safe time, safe of venous access, which surround us doesn't like, by the way. Um, and, um, but a very, um, very good device. And this is the type of case you have. You have a, a console, same as FFR, uh, and you plug and play. You plug at the back of the wire, and you can have the gradient. And I think that will be very useful for the future, especially when you start to do leaflet modification, uh, balloon valvoplasty, or, or, or just, you know, you start to remove piece of a leaflet, or valve and valve, should I crack or not? So it's really give a, a real feedback uh, during the procedure. Um, and this is, we did a little study of 20 patients correlate two pigtail measurement with this, with this console, and it show a very good level of agreement. So it's, it's, it's probably should become the new standard of care instead of two pigtail can become one, uh, only one sensor. This is a, a new uh, cool idea that Dave Daniels has, has started, it's called the solo pace. The concept initially was really to have an algorithm 
to stop having some, to, to talk to someone, to say, pace her on, pace her off. I told you stop pacing, what are you doing? Um, and it's called a solo pace, and it's, it's an algorithm that you, you connect to the, the, the wire it's for LV pacing. It could be RV also, but the intent is LV pacing, where you press a button and there's an algorithm that tests the, the, the threshold by itself and tell you when it's good to start the case. So very, very sneaky, uh, sneaky smart by Dave uh, Daniels. Um, we'll see how it will pan out, but he's doing good progress with that. Uh, and again, just to streamline the procedure. Then we're going to skip to what I believe it's really a cool topic, and I, I have to credit a lot of people for that, is leaflet modification. So it starts with electrosurgery, we tried to buzz uh, uh, everywhere. Then it went to mechanical cutting with Picardia, which has two devices we're going to talk, and then to uh, excision medical, uh, David Wood and Jannar, that uh, their baby, who will start to do, to remove leaflet with both mechanical force and electrosurgery. Um, it's all start with, you know, electrosurgery, uh, with transcable cases and, and, and basilica where people just want to cut and split leaflet with electrosurgery, what's used by surgeon. Um, and I have to credit the founder, the pioneer, the legend of this field, uh, um, and they did for the last 10 years, I will say, tremendous work, and you know those people, but they really pushed the envelope. And initially, it's, we thought, all thought it was crazy, but I would say the iteration uh, had come along the way very nicely. And this is the landscape, you know, it starts with unmet need. There's a patient with no access, and they say, let's go transcable, let's burn the IVC uh, and the aorta, and then it went to patient with uh, LVUT obstruction risk with a lampoon, and then basilica, et cetera. So the, what I like about this story is really, they, they really engineer something uh, to un answer unmet need for, to improve patient and allow technology, uh, procedure to happen, which, which I think it, it's what we, we should all do, be doing. Uh, basilica came a little bit later. Um, you know, it first starts with transcable and then lampoon and basilica. This is a typical basilica procedure, which you know could be a little bit um, complex, but uh, when you get good at it, 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 it's doable. Especially when you only split one leaflet, and um, and then I have to credit uh, J uh, Jafar, which actually take this um, custom made on the table bring it to a dedicated wire. So, and actually a full system. So the telltale system is. A dedicated guy for basilica, a wire, a wire gripper, um, 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 a denuder kinker. So a credit to him for the last seven years of push this, and it became a real system. And um, I would say the cornerstone of, uh, of, um, of his technology is the telltale wire, which is really dedicated wire to do electrosurgery and split. So congratulations to those, and I think um, that, that we're going to start to use it uh, much more in the future. Then the other route is not to burn, uh, it's to mechanically modify the leaflet, and this is Picardia uh, from Israel, and they had the leaflex, which is actually such as a, a type of valvulotome, um, and, and it's, there's, there's pose, there's blade, and you kind of crack and, and modify the leaflet pliability. They did a lot of study uh, on animal and patient, it worked well, and a much more uh, effect than a balloon valvuloplasty. And this is a new device, um, 16 French. You land with this little bumper on the, the sinus and the valve, and then you just uh, crack uh, the valve. Could be good as a standalone therapy, but also could be good to prep for a complex or a very heavily calcified valve. The other one, which is under study in US now, 60 patient almost finished enrollment, is the shortcut device. It's got a type of a dedicated basilica where you have a post and you have a little blade and you just split the leaflet in front of uh, the coronary. Um, so again, very, very easy 16 French sheet and delivery system. And we, 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 we did a couple of case at Morristown where we split one leaflet, two leaflet, and it's 15 minute procedure for both leaflet being split. So I would say that this is very, very uh, nice um, uh, iteration of Basilica, and we'll see what, what's gonna happen when, when they finish the feasibility study. Um, and this is, you know, the idea, the idea is to preserve the flow in both coronaries or, or when iris for occlusion. Like I said, a shortcut uh, study is ongoing, almost done. I think there's four or five patients to go among 60s, and, and so far, so good. And this is the type of result you can have. You see dual split. This is a case we did in Bordeaux initially, right and left split. And you can see the split. It's not hard to miss, uh, and it's very, very efficient. This is the last one uh, of, uh, called Excision Medical, again, from David Wood and Janar. And um, those combine both energy splitting, uh, electrosurgery, but also mechanical force. 
uh, and this is what you have. You can remove completely leaflet. And I think this one is very exciting. They're, they're just starting, but I think this one, keep, keep, this, keep this one in mind. I'm gonna talk about new valve briefly, X4 from Edwards. You can rotate the valve to align the post. I think that's a great iteration, and I think it would be useful for young patient. I think the next generation of heart valve are those one, Antares, which I think is, is a unique one leaflet, a super annular balloon expendable, very interesting, and eager to put my hand on, on this device. And then other, the Fold Dax, which actually is a polymer leaflet. We'll see how this thing will pan out, but I think there's, there's still innovation in the, on the valve side. I will be dismissed if I don't talk about the two J valve, uh, uh, Jenna valve and uh, the J valve, which actually for AR. So we're making a lot of good progress in AR also. And those valves are under study and, and have been used and, and, and very uh, exciting result also. So, and the last one is the medical XMED modular tower system, which tried to push a boundary in large bore, uh, 12 French delivery system. There's a docking station. You have to assembly, assemble the valve a docking station, and then the leaflet. We'll see how it pan out. The way they're working on a nine French equivalent tower system. So when we start to sell, we're gonna go radial. Maybe it's not that crazy anymore, but we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, so I wanna stop there. I, I think in conclusion, um, dedicated tools uh, for TAVR are, are emerging, and I think they will improve the efficacy and the safety of the procedure and really streamline everything. So uh, I think this, this is exciting uh, in one way. Leaflet modification, this is one part I'm very excited where we're gonna to start to remove leaflet like a surgeon and, and chop those leaflet. I think that's the future, whatever the energy uh, we're gonna use. Um, and the novel tower device, we'll see how it's gonna pay, play out, especially for durability. If this unique one leaflet or, 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 or polymeric tissue will change anything compared to surgery, but I think the field is exciting. So thank you for your attention. some discussion we have time for some discussion Philippe. yeah I think we've got a few minutes so um, so Philippe so the pacing wire uh, the absence wire so you don't put a temp wire in you just use the uh, pacing wire what what percentage of cases um, you know do you want to then put a temp wire in and, and um, you know how do you do that then IJ so I, I think um, I would say probably between five to 10%. And, and I, I will turn to uh, uh, our colleague, European, that's been LV pacing for a long time. In US, it's only 10%, but it's growing. I would say for me, my algorithm, if there's a right bundle branch block, I put a neckline with a TVP. But I still use absence because I like the gradient, I like the LV pace. I mean, there's the procedure and there's the recovery. So, you know, when you put the neckline in a, in a TVP, it's for the recovery. So with the 24, 48 hours, it's how you're gonna save the life of this patient at 2 a.m. in the morning, 24 hours after the procedure. It's not how you're gonna do the procedure. So for me, right bundle, big fat left bundle, more than 150 QRS. Those are the two that I put a neckline um, and a TVP. The rest, I, I don't even stick the vein in the femoral, I just pace and I look. Obviously, if you have a complete AV block, you can still pace on this wire. You have to pay attention. You become a little bit more, less cavalier in the procedure. You really pay attention. And most of the time, there's a transient AV block. It's recovered in one or two minutes. Um, so I don't know uh, uh, what is your experience uh, with this. Thank you, Philippe. Actually, in Europe, let's say I live in Italy, but the situation is more heterogeneous. But generally speaking, 90% of the cases, we use a lean and minimalistic approach. It is, uh, we have a single axis, more or less a radial, and then we go for guide-based temporary pacing, and uh, let's say in 80% of the cases, because unless we have a major conduction disturbances or major predictors, future pacemaker implantation or instability, actually we prefer to go with a wire. Yeah, it's funny you say that because before we, we were using pacing on Confida, uh, pacing on the Safari. It's just that it's um, the absence wire and, and the dedicated wire, there's another one coming, the Watson. Um, they're insulated, okay? So 
when we look at the threshold with the, the savvy wire, it's, it's around two. Compared to Savvy or uh, um, Safari and Confida, you have to, sh just to, to shave and everything. Some people say you don't, but the threshold could be at 10 or 15 sometimes. So it's a little bit more tricky. Do you, does it make a real difference technically if you blast off and you, it, probably not, but in a couple of cases it could. So if the wire move a little bit, and so I would say it's like a safety net. Um, the good thing, you know, we don't have money neither in New Jersey, but, but you know, we... we uh, Your reimbursement's we, a lot better than Ohio's, yeah, yeah. that's but, all I'm going to say. But I, I watch you do a, a, a live case. You spend your money where you want. You use Sentinel on everyone, so that's different, you know. We, <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, in, in the room, you mentioned, Philippe, congratulations. That was a whirlwind. And I wrote down all the new technologies you, you said, and it was, I mean, it was great in 12 minutes you covered all of these. I do want to ask the audience a couple of questions on some of this new technology. How many people are using um, some type of LV pacing instead of RV pacing? Raise your hand if you use LV pacing in more than 50% of your cases. Wow. OK. And the rest of you, I imagine, are using RV. How about? Um, uh, early bird, is that something that's starting to infiltrate into the site yet? Okay, some people are doing it. Okay, great. Um, and it seems like that there are a lot of adjunctive therapies, but you only showed one or two major valve therapies. Are we done with major valve? I mean, you showed the X4, that's great. J, you know, J valve, Gen valve, that's great, but that's already been out for years. Are we really, I mean, is polymers the next thing? You're not showing. Most of the new technology you showed are adjunctive, not necessarily radical movement in the TAVR world. Is that, you think, are we, are we, have we plateaued here? Or is it, what's the really big um, TAVR valve com um, pathway that we're gonna take? So that's a tough question. I, I think we were so distracted in the last 10 years to prove that TAVR was as good as surgery. So we kind of put our money on the big oars and, and you know, they, you know, tr you know, carry us through this journey. Now that, Thing are kind of more proven and, and stable. I think you see companies such as Antares uh, emerge. Um, I think the leaflet will be important. Um, I think Antares is certainly very uh, interesting, and um, I want to know more. Of course, the mode of failure of those valves sometimes dictate if they're going to last or not. You know, one leaflet is going to fail. I don't know. Uh, so it's interesting. I think Foldax is interesting. For me. What, what the, the surgical valve may last a little bit longer is you remove all the junk before putting a valve, you're circular, well expanded. And when you look at the, the failure of those TAVR valves, a lot of time it's because they're not well implanted, they're, they're under ex, um, uh, expanded. It's like a coronary stent. If you have 90% lesion calcified, the stent will be under expanded thrombosis and stenosis. This is going to be the same with TAVR. So if, if we can modify, remove the leaflet, pliable the leaflet, expand better, I think that would be, um, that would be great. The other, and I'm gonna preach for Paul and I study in moderate AS. When you do tavern moderate AS and the calcium score is 600, it's very pleasant. Uh, the gradient is like four and, and, and three. I saw one with S323. It's like, I think, it's again, if you do a, a, all the PCI you do is severely calcify 90% calcified lesion, you're not gonna have a type A lesion result. So I think by going a little bit, if you see the calcium score and it's low, I think you can have a good result, good expansion. So I think this is what we start to realize with TAVR. We need to imitate the surgeon, but also same thing with a low syntax score. We need to play with simple patient to make sure we have a bench test result. You know? Maybe last question. So Philip, you did a wonderful job, you know, covering a lot of technology. And it was really amazing to see all of that. What, I have a, along the same lines, I have, I phrased the question differently. What in your opinion, or anybody on the panel, is really the greatest unmet need in 2023 for TAVR, right? Because we've come a really long way. And if that's hard to answer, where do we get the biggest return for investing more, focusing more on the area? I, I truly believe it's a leaflet modification, leaflet removal. Because we're gonna start, let's say you do all the TAVR in modern AS in five, 10 years, and then you're gonna have to put three TAVR. You need to remove these leaflets, it's corner or low, I think, you know, yes, we can modify the native, slit, s split the bicuspid, remove the bicuspid, whatever, safely. And then you need to treat again. So I think if you can remove a piece of a leaf that may be um, problematic, I think that's great. Yep. Um, great. 
that's my can I answer Thanks. briefly to this yeah. point also just you know a few seconds to say <clears throat> the major med clinical need that we have uh, I think we have is the durability of the devices and secondly to demonstrate the repeatability of the procedure because you know he if Philips told before that is important like PCI, the parallelism with PCI is important because but the PCI is strong because actually you can repeat it. So the point is we need to demonstrate that, that it's feasible and this is clear but also that it's durable when we go for tower in tower. Yeah, and I, I think you know it's the same as PCI. If you underexpand a stent in a very calcified lesion and you try to you screwed. Okay. So I think the, the initial end plan is crucial. And as long as we cannot remove things or crack things, expand the, the stand or the valve better, I think uh, we're going to have issues to have good durability. But I think that you're right on. I mean, we need a valve that lasts 15, 20 years in a repeated fashion. So. Thanks, Philippe. That was a great. Yeah, let's do that. So we're going to have um, Lucy. Safi, are you here? Lucy? Lucy is going to talk about uh, Basilica success. And if you guys could, Nick, you want to just let us know when you found the slides and then we'll go from there. All right, good morning. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Basilica success through imaging. Um, I will not be going through the Basilica procedure. I'm an imager. Uh, but what I will do is uh, try to convince you the importance of imaging for this complicated procedure. And so these are my disclosures. And our case today is a 75-year-old female. Uh, she presented with complaints of dyspnea. And her pertinent cardiovascular history includes that in uh, 2014, she had severe aortic stenosis and underwent placement of a mitral flow uh, surgical valve. She has a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Her EF is about 35%. Um, and non-obstructive coronary disease. So moving on to her echo, here you can see that her valve is uh, significantly degenerated. I think diagnosis in one picture right there on the right, you can see that there is some inflow turbulence, uh, sorry, outflow turbulence, um, but a AS doesn't seem like it's the primary issue here. Uh, her valve is degenerated. She has severe aortic insufficiency. And on Doppler, what you can see is that her valve area is 1.6. Again, not AS. Uh, it's more of an AR as the issue. Uh, you can see that that dense AR jet in the bottom left there. And uh, the global dilated ventricle that she, she has. So because of that dilated ventricle, we were thinking that this is not an acute process. This is something that has been going on for a while and uh, most likely the cause of her dyspnea at this point. Um, we went through you know, the normal workup. We ordered a CT for her. Uh, we looked her up in the Valve and Valve app, which is wonderful, and decided that if we move forward uh, with a TAVR, which valve that would be uh, most likely core valve is what we decided. But um, more details on her CT. Uh, unfortunately, her coronary heights seem to be low. Um, and this was a little frustrating for us. Uh, her leaflet lengths were longer, uh, and uh, her sinuses were not that wide, uh, much more narrow. So we were thinking um, obstruction may be an issue here. We presented her at our multidisciplinary meeting. And uh, these are some of the things that we were thinking about. Um, you know, With this low coronary heights, what would be the risk of her obstruction? And she already has severe AR. Um, you know, doing a basilica, how will that add to it? Should we have a balloon pump on standby? Um, and so we decided that, you know, we can have a balloon pump on standby, but the fact that it was a chronic process, it's not acute AR, her ventricles dilated, but that's also not new for her, um, that if we would move forward with a basilica, that she should be fine without any other uh, support. So, um, we went through, this is um, by Gilbert Tang, um, published this. This is just some of the things that we thought about. Uh, so does the leaflet extend above the coronary ostium? Yes. Um, but for her, um, it doesn't quite get to the STJ level. Her virtual transcatheter valve to coronary height was actually low. Um, so then, yes, we should consider basilica. So these are some really nice pictures um, from Vlad uh, Jalnin in our lab. We have CT fusion, echo fusion. Um, so just some examples here. This is our CT fusion from the case. Um, you can see here the snares are ready across the valve, and uh, they already did the electrocautery. And um, it's really this fast, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> 
Um, when you have EchoFusion, it's really helpful. You can line it up quickly and you can cauterize uh, the leaflets uh, pretty straightforward. So that's what the IC sees. Um, this is what we see as an imager. So I'll talk you through the imaging aspects of it. So your working view really is that short axis view uh, on Echo. You can see that there's two wires through the valve here. There's the snare. You can see it best on the 3D. Um, there's the snare and then there's the electrocautery wire. And so we were aiming to do the cauterization for the uh, left, the anatomical left coronary. And um, again, you can really see it well on 3D. And so after we isolated it, um, if you do have echo fusion, which we also do, um, you can see here this is the actual cauterization aspect of it. And so when I'm at the table, what I, can, what I usually look at is both the echo but also the fluoro. And the fact that we have the echo fluoro fusion in the top right, you're able to follow along and really know at what point you're at. So here, this is when they actually burned through the leaflet and uh, entered into the LV before it was snared. And so uh, after cauterization, her severe AR was still there. Um, you know, it didn't get better, but it didn't get worse either. And hemodynamically, there was really no change. I think she was just so used to having so much AR. Um, so we didn't even feel rushed, to be honest. I think it was just a pretty much straightforward valve and valve after that. Um, and uh, so showing you those pictures here. Again, back to our working view. I know the wire's still there, but you can see that the leaflet was actually like uh, lacerated rather nicely on, on echo. Um, but you know, it's not just lacerating the right leaflet, but it's also making sure that you still have coronary flow and that you're not um, obstructing anything during the whole process. So after the valve uh, was brought in, um, so here you can see the valve being brought in on the CT fusion on the left. I'm not sure if the video on the right will play. Um, can you try to play that video on the right? Thank you. So um, they went ahead and they deployed the core valve. Um, again, pretty straightforward routine, valve and valve there. And then they did an angiogram, an aortogram at the end, showing that there was perfusion into that left main. So that's the fluoro. Here's the echo. So on echo, you can see that they were uh, going up with the valve on the left. And then uh, on the right, you can see that really after uh, deployment, not much PVL at all, very trivial. But um, my favorite part is to just make sure that you assess. And one, one of the most important parts is to assess the coronary flow to make sure that there's no obstruction. So this is our uh, echo angiogram here. You can see that the left main is wide open. And really, we confirm this with also color Doppler. And so she did great. She was discharged. Uh, three months later, she came in with chest pain. Um, but you know, I, you know, it wasn't really. Um, anything that we were too worried about because we thought we did a really good job and we don't routinely get CTs on our patients after valve and valve. I know that was something we talked about yesterday to look for halt or for any other complications, but you know, her valve was perfect. There was no halt, there was no obstruction, it was non-cardiac chest pain, um, but it gave us an opportunity to get a coronary CT and to really check out. So overall, I think she did an excellent job. So um, just to wrap things up, uh, T is a great modality to complement and supplement your complicated cases such as a basilica. Um, when you're doing the procedure, you wanna make sure that you assess coronary flow and uh, do a quick assessment of any AR, any kind of complications. Thank you. First of all, Philippe, I wanna to mention to you that surgeons do do it wrong. Us putting in mitra flows was a bad damn idea. Okay, so you don't always wanna be like the surgeons, that's all. We didn't know at the time. <laughs> You know, yeah, question, <coughs> Nick. Thank you. So who uses fusion imaging in the room? Really? Yeah. Um, it, we have not, um, because part of it takes a processing, takes a while, and then you gotta make sure that the CT that you took was exactly the way the patient's laid, they're not bumped up to the right or left, and so we've just done it without it, but we're, we, we um, too many things on the screen for us, I get confused. I was gonna say the same thing, looking at those images. I, I think you have some comments out there, maybe.
Interesting. Yeah, I think that's what we've used at most as PVL closures. I have, I have a question for you, Lucy. Yeah. I, I think the missing piece, obviously, is motion compensation. Any thoughts, insights as to when we get to motion compensation? Because the CT will be just standing there, right, where the fluoro is still moving. Yeah, so that's where echo fusion comes into play. So there's, I showed both. I showed CT fusion and echo fusion. So CT, CT was already acquired, um, and so move, uh, you know, patient positioning can affect it. Uh, you do uh, tag it to to really correlate it, but echo is live, and so you know it's real time and it's live. So really doesn't take that long. Um, what takes long with the echo fusion is building the heart model, the anatomical intelligence. But when you have Ecofusion Lab, um, as soon as the tip of the TE probe is, is under fluoro, like literally one, one acquisition on CINE, and it's done. You can move the table up and down, and I mean, you can do whatever you want with the table height, it won't affect it. It yeah. only affects positioning um, if you uh, do the anatomical intelligence and move. So that's the positive of echo fusion over CT fusion. So Lucy, I thought your images were perfect without any fusion, just FYI. <laughs> um, what were your final gradients? Last clip. Yeah. yeah. Eyes. Eyes. Quite a question uh, so that everybody could hear is, could you, from Dr. Siraj, is could you use ice instead of uh, fusion? I, we've never done it. Um, love to see if anyone has done it. Um, I guess you can park the ice catheter in the left atrium and uh, do it that way. So there, I guess there is a workaround, but I personally have we not. We haven't done so ice for basilicas. We do it a lot for tricuspid and mitrals, but not necessarily for basilicas. We haven't done that. <laughs> Uh, can I ask a question? What was your final gradient, by the way? You never mentioned that. Yeah, I, I'm sorry I didn't have that. It was low. I don't remember, but okay. it was it was low. Great. Philippe, maybe the last question. <laughs> What did you say? What did you, we can't hear you. So why not put a wire? Why not put a wire in the? Do we have a roving microphone? Yeah. Maybe. My question was, uh, why don't you just put a wire in, in the left main and aim for this wire with the device? You know, so in Basilica, you never, you never. I mean, sometimes you protect the coronary, but I, I think instead of like guessing, you want to really cross in front of the coronary. So why don't you? I always thought, of why don't you have a coronary? Uh, guide in the corner with a wire and then you poke through a hole through the catheter and snare it. You know what I mean? You yeah. want to, you, you just need to go where the corner is, so just engage the corner and go there. So is there something con to consider? Because I'm going to do that for shortcut. You know? Uh, we prefer to do <clears throat> that in pre-procedural planning, to be honest. Actually, with this valve, you decide to go with core valve because of the small valve, huh? because the mitral flow was small. Yeah, it was a 20. So I actually think what is important is in pre-procedural planning, you understand exactly where you are. You can correct. You can go correctly, you know, with the marker that you have in the core valve and to orient the valve. But what we do differently is to go, in this case, with direct coronary cannulation to demonstrate that it is possible to be selective. I don't know if it is useful or not, but sometimes we, we have a, a prospective register in this area, 650 patients, all cases with direct cannulation after valve valve, just to understand the difference among the different type of valves. So imaging is important, but sometimes getting in, you know, selectively can give you the visualization, the guarantee that you're there. So after you deploy the valve, yes. you'll take an You go for coronary, no, we go for direct coronary cannulation in case of valve valve like that. So I, I think that was, the lot, that was the thing I was going to ask. Yeah. Number one is, should the interventional cardiologist go back after that case is done and prove that they could cannulate yeah. the coronary arteries? Yeah. And then they number two did. is, can you get commissure alignment inside that surgical valve with any of our new devices? So is that, is that important? After, I didn't show it just because of the sake of time, but after they deployed the, the valve, they did check and there was flow into the RCA and to the... Yeah, yep. yeah. That's why when she came back with chest pain three months later, we weren't really con concerned, uh, but we got the CT anyways. I mean, should, should we go to the next case? We're running already a little behind here. I don't you want to, um, all right, Nick, come on up, I guess, yeah. I was going to also comment that, you know, coronary engagement isn't always the purpose or the goal with basilica. So, you know, you want to be able to have a maximal splay and, um, 
coronary cannulation isn't always going to be feasible regardless, um, as long as you have a splay in the middle of the leaflet that gives you appropriate diastolic flow into that coronary sinus. It'd be ideal if it was in front of the coronary, but anyway, so that's not what I'm here to talk about though. Uh, my name is Nick Amoroso and I'm going to present an aortic regurgitation case. These are my disclosures. So this is a 60 year old uh, man with, who presented with class three heart failure, dyspnea on exertion and aortic regurgitation. His history includes HIV hypertension. He had had endocarditis um, the year prior, which resulted in some aortic and tricuspid valve degeneration. It was complicated by spinal discitis. Um, he did not have an indication for surgery at the time and it cleared with uh, antibiotics. Um, his kidney function is almost normal, but his PFTs uh, were not, and he was frail and considered high risk for surgery. We can see that over the following year, his ejection fraction had started to decline and was now mildly uh, reduced. He had moderate to severe aortic regurgitation and severe left ventricular dilatation with global hypokinesis. So being that he was a high surgical risk, we were assessing him for transcatheter therapies. Uh, here, looking at his annulus, we can see he would size for a commercial valve. No significant calcification, though, on his leaflets or in the annulus. Um, otherwise, favorable angle. He's a, a you know, trichomacheural um, aortic valve. <coughs> STJ is large. We're not worried about coronary obstruction with any of our devices. But again, no calcium. His uh, transfemoral access has some narrowings in the iliacs, but I think most of us would feel comfortable pushing through. Perhaps a little angioplasty to help if you needed. So the uh, question is, what should we do now? We know that TAVR devices uh, commercially available in the US uh, rely on calcium for anchoring. That TAVR in non-calcific aortic regurgitation <clears throat> comes with an elevated risk, but we don't want to leave this patient untreated because aortic regurgitation is quite morbid. 24% uh, one-year mortality for patients with untreated severe symptomatic aortic regurgitation. And uh, Vinod also tells us that 74% of these symptomatic patients do not receive treatment within the year of their diagnosis. So procedural success with the off-label commercial TAVR uh, in the U.S. here in this kind of pooled analysis shows that there's about 80% success, and I would argue that these are selected patients, though. <clears throat> and more than 10% of these patients require uh, multiple transcatheter valves for situations like this, which makes often for This is not technically a THV and THV because the two THVs are separate. Good point, yes. But it is a... That's how the statistic came up, but <laughs> this is more of a THV on THV, maybe? So our resolution for this clinical problem is uh, Yena valve in this case. Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, this, <clears throat> this valve is unique in that it uses these um, locators, which you see um, kind of splayed out like a bar stool legs there on the leaflets. Uh, we're able to use those for both capture of the leaflets, which provides some um, stability in the implant or uh, perhaps contributes to the anchoring. Uh, it also allows us for alignment with the commissures and the large cells that are uh, above the outflow here allows for easy coronary engagement as well. Additionally, Patients are at elevated risk for paravalvular leak uh, in these situations, and so the incorporating the leaflets into uh, the implant also helps limit the potential for paravalvular leak. The delivery system has a, let me see if this plays, there we go, uh, a built-in deflection mechanism that lets you get coaxial with the valve. And then as you approach the valve itself, we see in the middle panel, we use uh, fluoroscopy as well as echo to um, check that our locators are in fact centered on each of the commissures, um, excuse me, on each of the cusps. Um, once we have confirmed that, then you lower it down to the level of the annulus and then we're checking to make sure that we have captured the leaflets. Once that's all been confirmed, then we release the valve 
this is shown as a two-step system. Now it's currently a, more of a one-step system, really. So here seeing it uh, live on fluoroscopy for this case, we can do selective angiograms in each of the coronary cusps to, again, show that we have captured the leaflet. We want the locators to be on the outside of the leaflet, so to speak, and the valve itself is down the center um, of, of our aortic annulus. Once we've done that for each cusp and deployed the valve, you can see that there is excellent positioning right where we left it. Um, coronaries are easily reaccessed. And this patient had had some chest discomfort leading up to uh, the case, so we chose to shoot a coronary angiogram following deployment as well, easily engaged here with a JL. So it is one year follow-up. He has class one, two heart failure symptoms. Uh, his LV dilatation had improved, though his systolic function remained about the same. Um, the dimensionless index for this valve was 0.85, which is pretty fantastic, uh, with a mean gradient across the valve of calculated at four. But you can see that's with a LVOT <coughs> velocity of 1.1. So really great hemodynamics uh, on this result. So. Uh, with this, I'd say that our, our solution should be TAVR with leaflet fixation or another, <coughs> another mechanism to help ensure that we have a uh, implant that's not going to fly away. Um, Tricommensural alignment is certainly a plus, as is the procedural success and safety profile with this system. Um, the hemodynamics, I think, have been excellent and very low rates of significant paravalvular leak. So non-calcific aortic regurgitation deserves a dedicated device system. Uh, for this system in particular, the trial uh, finished and is anticipated to collect their one-year data uh, later this year. And already CE marked for this indication, but we're hoping to see that it receives FDA approval uh, in 2024. One last little plug. Um, I think the other big part about treating aortic regurgitation is just being aware of aortic regurgitation. I think that many of our referrings underappreciate the severity. It's a complicated thing to get an accurate diagnosis of. Um, and this was just some interesting data that we presented at TVT showing that patients who are graded as moderate aortic regurgitation um, still have a very significant morbidity and mortality, particularly in those who have a dilated left ventricle. Um, arguably, people who have a dilated left ventricle, maybe the grading of their AR was underdiagnosed, but this is the information that you get. Um, so patients with moderate AR and dilated left ventricles, we need to be a little bit more aggressive in our workups, perhaps. Um, because their mortality rates is just as bad as many severe or worse than severe AR without LV dilatation. Thanks. It's a great talk, Nick. Um, <clears throat> I, I, th I think you hit on this, but I just want to emphasize the, um, you know, it's a slippery slope. TAVR is so successful that we want to do it for everybody. But for AI, you know, outside of this trial, uh, if, if you weren't participating in this trial, this 60-year-old patient with severe AI, what would you have thought about, you know, the commercial options we have available versus surgery? Yeah, it, it makes for a very um, stressful day for me, right? <laughs> you know, that's not a case that I'm looking forward to, um, even though... I think the sound of 80% procedural success sounds not terrible. In reality, I mean, that's, that's not what we're aiming for. Um, and when that goes wrong, sometimes it goes terribly wrong. I think the picture I showed of the valve on top of a valve is, frankly, often the best case scenario. Um, when it goes ventricular for its embolization, which it often does in those sorts of cases, uh, then that's a much bigger issue. Because now you've turned somebody who is high surgical risk into somebody who's having an emergent surgery, um, which, as I understand, it's not good. Um, hey, Nick, I have a question for you. You and Vino, actually. You were kind enough to be our proctor for our genovalve cases, the initial ones. We did them under 
transesophageal echo and, and, um, and uh, general anesthesia. The, it's a little bit bigger device, 20 French, I believe, right? And so, um, and then there was one case where I had trouble locating the left cusp, getting that locator in that left cusp. Is this device good enough for general use in the community once it gets approved? And um, I know Vino's whispering in my ear that he's gonna do, he's looking at other studies. Is this device good enough? Yeah, so I think that it has become reproducible. Um, you can successfully capture leaflets just about every time, but maybe not every time. Um, with the deflection, you know, and I think to put the, some sort of number just to characterize that, I mean, you're talking about high 90 percentile, I mean, you know, 99 percent of the time. I don't, that's not a real statistic, but that's my gestalt. If you're talking about, you know, large non-calcified aortic regurgitation valves, then it's different than patients who come in with combined AS and AR. Patients who have aortic stenosis, then you don't have as much leaflet mobility, so capturing those leaflets is not as difficult. Um, so certainly that is a much simpler proposition. Um, but I think ultimately it has become a delivery system that can be effectively used um, in the large majority of patients. Admittedly, it takes a little bit more care than put the dot in the middle and blow up the balloon. I mean, you know, just a couple of comments on this, because um, Torsen, Marty, and I are the national PIs for this. We will have data we're submitting to TCT late breaking. Um, probably if everything goes well, which it should, we'll you know, have this valve in hands next year. I think that it is reproducible. Um, I think it's a couple of nuances. We've, I actually use it a lot for AS. And you can go down to almost four millimeter coronary height because you have complete, it's the only valve where you actually have true commercial alignment. We haven't seen a case um, more than one or two percent where you don't, can't put it in the right commissure. Sometimes it's tricky, and that's why bicuspids are not applied for this. It has to be a tri leaf, but we have three sinuses. We haven't done many bicuspid cases. And yes, I am about to have a second FDA talk about an all comers trial, um, which I think will take it to another level. But as far as surgery goes, I think it's doable for these patients using other valves. But when you use other valves, you have to be about a 20 to 25 percent oversizing and you have to have your Edwards rep in the room, and then you put a 34 core valve in, and then you put a 29 plus four sapien in. It's $60,000 of implant. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, personally, the results, you know, are marginal at best. So, so you know, stop there. Yeah, that was, you know, that was a great case. So one one particular patient population that we see every so often are LVAD patients that have AI and heart failure. And they've been very difficult for us to treat in the past, and we'll do that game of a 34 Evolute, and we're crossing our fingers and probably putting a, a Sapien inside it. Any experience in this patient population and any particular things to look out for? Yeah, so there, there is a good experience, I think, treating some LVAD patients who have this aortic regurgitation. Um, that has been documented. Um, so, uh, you just have to have a lot of oversize. We've done two yeah. of them in the last three months. You have to have over 20% oversizing or you'll jack it up pretty bad. So I think that's... You're point. talking about which valve? No, I'm uh, talking... Well, for us, we've used a Sapien with um, a lot of oversizing. Oh, but with we have not... You, have unless you? you use Compassionate, you can't use Yenna valve for LVADs. It's only in Compassionate. Europeans may be able to do it, but we can't. But right. you, it's you been know, done with compassionate use case. That, it has been done effectively. We decided not to go after the LVAD right. population because we think it's a smaller population. We decided to do an all comers. Maybe we got to go to the next topic. Paul, did you have a quick question? Okay. I can, can I just make a quick comment for LVAD? So if you use the regular valves, you want to turn down the LVAD flows if you can. With this one, you don't want to do that. Actually, you want to do the other. You want to go the other way, if anything, if you can. All right, great. Great job. Ethan is going to talk a little bit about valve fracturing. Ah, perfect. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so, um, so uh, my topic is the ultimate balloon valve fracturing. And I, I tried to pick a case that was, I would say, the most controversial in our valve conference over the past year. Um, so here's a case, 68-year-old man. He had an AVR in 2013. It was an Edwards 25. 
And in 2020, so after his AVR, he had a big motorcycle accident, which wrecked him. He had a hemidiaphragm repair, and he had uh, an abdominal wound, which is sort of chronically infected with mesh, and he's on chronic suppressive antibiotics. But after this, he came in with syncope and heart failure. And because of this sort of ongoing abdominal wound process, our surgeons really didn't want to operate on him. They thought, let's bridge him with a TAVR, maybe buy him a few years, get his abdominal wound fully treated, and then maybe down the road he could eventually have surgery. His echo showed a preserved, relatively preserved EF of 50%, and his mean gradient, which was 20 a year ago, is now up to 47 millimeters. And importantly, he's a bigger guy. So his, uh, he weighs 255 pounds, and his BMI is 34. So here are his pictures. So uh, this is, again, a, uh, it's a 25 millimeter valve. And it's one of these cases where the, the, if you look in the sort of bottom center, so the valve to coronary is 3.8, but the valve is sort of tipped over to the side, you can see. So the valve to the, uh, to the sort of uh, STJ is only 1.8 millimeters, even though the sinuses themselves are really big. And it's also one of these cases where the aorta, it takes a quick turn as soon as it goes up. And so, you know, my preference in general is to use a self-expanding valve, especially in a bigger person like this, when I'm doing valve and valve so that we get the best gradients, the least patient prosthesis mismatch. But I really worry about the upper crown of the evolute in a case like this. It's going to dig into the aorta. Maybe it won't sort of fully expand. Um, that causes a lot of concern. Here's his angiogram. So you can see the left coronary is really sort of right sort of right underneath the top of the post, and the sinus is relatively big, but again, the STJ is a little bit narrow. So in this kind of case, and there's the profile again, we debated a lot in our valve conference. So what should the left coronary pr protection strategy be? Should we do leaflet modification? What type of valve should we do, balloon expandable or self-expanding? And most importantly, is it safe to fracture the valve? And if we do that, should it be done before or after? So as I said, I really didn't want to use a self-expanding valve in this case because I was concerned about height and interaction with the aorta. So it meant a balloon expandable valve. And in that case, really since his BMI is so big, we sort of felt that we had to fracture. Now when it comes to fracturing, you know, we're, we've been pretty swayed by trials uh, showing uh, that, uh, <laughs> courtesy of Adnan, uh, showing that people really do better in general if you fracture after TAVR implant. Um, and we've certainly done some cases where we've fractured before and patients get unstable. And I think that's really sort of driving it. Patients really don't tolerate that acute AI very well. Uh, but this is a case uh, where we were concerned enough that we were sort of tipping towards a fracture before strategy so that we could protect the coronaries. Now, when it comes to coronary protection, I, I could ask everyone on the panel and everyone in the room, and I bet everyone has a sort of different philosophy to it. There's multiple options. You can use just a guide. You can use just a wire. You can use a guide extension. You can put down a balloon. You can put down a full stent. And, of course, a variety of opinions on leaflet modification as well. So here's how we approached this case, and I love the panel's input. So uh, we did coronary protection with a six French EBU guide. Uh, and our typical practice is to put down a wire and a guide extender. We've really never had a case where we've needed to deliver a stent if the coronary is pinched, if we have a guide extender down where we haven't been able to get it through. And we have had cases where we have a stent downstream and you try to pull it back and the stent strips off the balloon and then you're dealing with a nightmare. So our sort of way of splitting it is to put the guide extender down, relatively atraumatic, we think, and, uh, and go from there. And then once we had the guide extender in place, we did fracture with a 25 millimeter true balloon. And we did elected in this case not to use a leaflet modification, but to just go in directly with a uh, valve and valve. So here's a 26 millimeter Sapien 3. Um, you can see there's a little bit of sort of moving around, so a, a little bit of sort of held breath during the deployment, but eventually it got to a sort of stable place and took the right opportunity and deployed it um, in, in an adequate position. Is that with, a new technique, Ethan? What's that? Is that a new technique? <laughs> <laughs> the bucking bronco technique in uh, uh, Austin style. 
Um, and what's nice about having the guide extender there, if, you know, we had the six French uh, guide extender and a six French uh, guide, so we could measure the pressure downstream. And if our pressure uh, tracing is, is sort of normal in the car noise, then we know that that's, um, that's sort of confidence inspiring. Oops. And then I guess, so here's our picture. Uh, after TAVR deployment. So coronaries uh, look like they have a good flow um, uh, afterwards. So coronaries are protected and the gradients improved significantly. So echo gradient was 14 millimeters of mercury. Um, interestingly enough, he did require a pacemaker. I mean, our feeling, you know, I guess I always think of valve and valve as having a lower pacemaker rate, but I think if you fracture valves, I think it does change that. I think your pacemaker rate does come up a bit. And in fact, he did require a pacemaker, but he was able to go home post-op day two. Um, so our learnings from this case and our debate that we got out of our valve team was uh, when the coronaries are at risk, really I think an intraannular valve may be preferable. And in this case with the aorta taking an angle, that was really, we thought, our only option. If you have to fracture, do it first because you really don't want to be in a position where you have a snorkel stent and then you're fracturing it after. Uh, it really does complicate the coronary protection and consider leaflet modification when appropriate. We do basilica, um, but we're you know maybe a little bit more basilica skeptics and we really reserve it for only the highest risk cases and we just didn't feel it was necessary in this case. But I'd love the input of the panel. So what, one, of, one of our concerns, you know, over time has been that when we're protecting a coronary, um, that, you know, your guide extension or your guide is um, propping the leaflet back, mm -hmm. you know, and that when you, when you remove that stuff, then maybe you will obstruct. Um, have, you, have you had that concern? Um, I, we have not had a case where we've transduced a normal pressure and had a normal angiogram um, through the guide and then pulled it back and it, it caused an issue. Um, Giuseppe, though, was, uh, just had an excellent suggestion up there as we were talking that he was saying that he likes to take an angiogram with a guide after a valve and valve taver just to sort of prove that it's doable and also to suggest for any future operators what guide would, would work to engage the coronary. I mean, that's something that really stresses me out. We're sending a lot of these patients out with valve and valve tavers or complex anatomies and they're going into the community if they show up with a STEMI in the middle of the night. Um, it's going to be hard for some operators, some of whom who have never engaged a TAVR valve to, uh, to engage and, and treat these patients. So how many people in the audience would have used a core valve for this patient? 25, um, um, you know, um, in spirit, not in spirits at that time, but 25 Edwards Magna valve. How many people would have used a core valve for this patient? Raise your hand. How many people would have used a Sapien in this? So maybe 50-50, isn't that interesting? Okay. See, I tried to get controversy, Paul. Yeah. Um, and, and we would, we would, and did you measure pre and post gradients? Uh, for this? Yeah. Uh, the post was 14 and the pre, at least no, an echo was. No, 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 I'm talking about before, you don't, before the balloon fracturing or not necessarily. Oh. Uh, you see what I'm saying? You, yeah, you put it I don't in, know that we did, yeah. You put it in and that's what we've been doing. Yeah. So why, why balloon fracture if you don't need to? Um, especially with a 25 valve. I get it with a 20, well, we did I get it, it with a 21, I get it with a 19, but with a 25, that would be the thing that we would have done differently. Yeah, we did it pre though, because we were worried if we put in the valve and then uh, fractured it, that that could compromise the coronaries. Um, yeah. okay, would you yeah, be concerned with the, am I sort of over uh, concerned about the interaction of the aorta and a tall self-expanding valve? No, I think, um, in fact, I said that to Steve. Uh, no, not really. Okay. I mean, it's a valve and valve who gives a shit. You know? <laughs> and so when you go to, when, you, when somebody goes to operate on this patient down the road, yeah. which I've done so many times, I've taken so many TAVR valves out, the core valve is much har harder, especially in women where it's really ingrown into it. But I've never, in however long I've been doing this, I've never had to do a root replacement. Hmm. I'm able to get a 15 blade and just carve it out hmm. from inside, and I've never had to do a root for this, ever. Hmm. And um, if you look at the tavern tab data, or ta surgery after tavern data, the root replacements are where it lead to a lot of mortality. You have to keep it simple, yeah. and I've never had to do that. So that, quite honestly, isn't the reason. It's the repeat coronaries that Steve and I were talking yeah. about. That would have been the reason I would use a balloon expandable valve for this patient. Yeah. Philippe? Oh. 
a great case, actually. I just want two comments. The first one is uh, we used to do a little bit of basilica, but it seemed that I was always trying to find a reason not to do it. It should be okay. I, mean, I think the sinuses are large. Since we start shortcut, or you know, it's so easy that now I try to find a reason to do it. So I think that's. I think the threshold will change when we have a very easy technique because this is a beautiful case. You split, you're done, and yeah. young patient, you want to preserve access. So um, we have how many? The other question. Oh yeah. So the other question is: um, uh -huh. Is it a real phenomenon that when you fracture, you need to put a larger valve? The HAP always say that you know, be careful. If you fracture, you may need a bigger valve after. Is it something you appreciate or, or not really? Our goal, our goal is simply to optimize the expansion of the THV that you're putting in. <clears throat> so sometimes that might allow you to use a larger valve, and sometimes it's just, you know, it's the same valve you would have used otherwise, mm -hmm. but we just want to optimize the expansion of it. And, it. and when we're talking about this coronary obstruction, it's a, you know, a common question. So does BVF increase the risk of coronary obstruction? I think actually in your case, it would not have. Um, so imagine, you know, so you fractured the valve first, right? But imagine that you'd put the 26 sapien in and then fractured. Your 20, your, your sapien would have done this, right? It's that, you know, right. it's constrained at the ring, not at the top. The top of your 26 sapien would have been 26, um, even if you had, you know, uh, put it in first. And when you did the BVF, it would only it would expand at the level of the annulus, right. not your coronaries were at the top of the valve, you know? Yeah. And so BVF had nothing to do with, I, I, I think, the risk of coronary obstruction, yes. and you could have done it the other way as well. Yeah. So do you think that, how many people have done a um, tavern at Inspiris? I've done some. Have you, do you need to do that? Because remember, it's got the built-in mechanism. Are we gonna need to do BVF when it already is gonna move two millimeters? So it takes a little bit of pressure, though, I think, to uh, expand the inspiris. So w we might need to, I mean, it's not a BVF, but we might need to, um, you know, uh, use an inflator to certain atmospheres to, you know, fully expand so it. So Pradeep should do the inflation on that one and not me. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> so so what, we wrap this up. What is, the, uh, what is the pressure to expand the inspiris, though? Because... I mean, Does if anybody we're know? At least, you're talking about atmosphere-wise? Yeah, atmosphere-wise. What is the... At least you want to know the, the, the atmosphere you want to use in this... Well, case. I mean, yeah, if we fracture yes, at 12... Uh, the the rule that I generally better. follow is the <clears throat> following. Two millimeters bigger than the inner diameter or one millimeter bigger than the outer diameter, at least 12 atmosphere, at least. But you need easily to go to 16, in my experience. 16? Are you sure? for that ring seems fracture. like a lot to me. That doesn't seem right. I mean, the reason why I ask is because it makes a difference where you have, where you have to have two end deflators or not, right? Right. I mean, with a stopcock. I don't. So. I, I'm not sure that. I, I don't know that 16. 16 seems really. 16 high, is yeah. generally. I mean, 16 is what we're doing BVF at. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's so. kilograms versus well. pounds. Maybe there's a difference in yes. conversion. Can I, I make mean, a comment <laughs> okay. to this case? Can I make another comment to this case? So actually, I would like to tell you another way to, you know, to do this case, because actually I don't like to go with a ring fracture before the implantation of the second valve. I'll tell you why, because I have had two cases of cardiogenic shock before this, and actually sometimes, and this is the real problem, I think, that you don't know if you really need to go for ring fracture. Yeah. Because in this case, if you go with a 26 valve, at the end, you might have, a, a, let's say, a final gradient of 18 millimeter of mercury, surprisingly. This is totally different when you go for 19 or 29. So in my experience, what I prefer is to be safer for the patient to go with a 26 nominal. Then you can measure the gradient. If you have 40 or 42, that it happens, you can go with post dilatation first at 12, you can measure again, then you go up to 16 to be as safer as possible. Because sometimes it's more important than to be extremely effective. So this is my experience. So Morris, just, last, just, last comment, and then we gotta move on to Steve. He's ready to go look at him. He's chomping. Yeah, just really quick comment. So I, I, I fall in the same camp, you know, post BVF, just because sometimes you don't need it, and then why do something to the valve and potentially damage it? And people go back and forth pre, post BVF, what's better, you know, all the pros and cons, and the best date, and most of that that is just you know personal experience and whatever, but the best data we have is a your inter intervention paper from I think two years ago, so where they actually looked and compared post and pre BVF, and for whatever it's worth, you know they said post actually results in better gradients on average. You know probably more to be learned there, but I, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
Great, thanks. We do post also. Steve, you're up. Great job. Okay, thanks. Great job, Ethan. Um, Paul, thanks for having me here. First of all, I, I love this format. This is awesome. And I do want to credit you for teaching me that when you present, especially on a case like this, to put the panel, uh, make, go on the offensive and make the panel ask all the questions. So we're going to get to we're gonna get through this. Here we go. All right. So those are my disclosures. This is, uh, I have two cases to get through. Let's see if I can get through both of them. 84-year-old man, progressive shortness of breath, uh, had a 25, or a 29 core valve six years earlier. He was in, he was a high-risk patient then. Initial echocardiogram showed mild PVL. Over the years, his PVL became more progressive. No uh, infective endocarditis, and he has a mean greater of 14, and he presents now with a TE that shows intravalvular as well as moderate PVL. So he has no significant coronary artery disease. He is native coronary artery dependent. Here's his imaging. So you see there's severe intravalvular. Okay. Ah, dang, how do I go back? All right, so Vino, what do we do? I mean, you're asking the surgeon, man. Uh, oh, I, I want to show you the initial an implantation. Here's the, here's oh. the initial implantation of the valve. This was six years earlier, and you could see that the, this is before cusp overlap technique, and the valve's... Um, I don't think cusp, uh, cusp overlap is going to help you with that PVL. Okay. Well, what happened was this slid down, so you could see that the uh, implantation's yeah. a little low at the end of the procedure. So this yeah. is probably an implantation depth of six or eight. So we yeah. were able to find the old films where he had this done, and... And so, so look, I mean, we would do, I mean, I would see that we'd get a TAVR CT in this patient. He's 84. I'd operate on him. But, you know, I think you, these days we do a lot of TAV and TAVs, but we'd start to think about a TAV and TAV if, he does, if we don't think he has an active infection. He's 84. He was, eight, he was high risk six years earlier. Here's his CT. Yeah. You can see I the mean, implantation depth is low. He's totally native coordinated. And but you still I, would operate on him? No, I'm, I'm just saying that we would evaluate him. High, high risk, every site's different. If he was high risk at our institution and seen by a surgeon that we think is a, a good surgeon, great. If he's high risk from Podunk, Georgia, that's a whole different scenario because we operate on a lot of people. But I would work him up for a TAV and TAV, and if he wasn't, then we'd obviously look at him for a potential surgery. Uh, I'm glad you does, said Podunk, Georgia, to... and not Columbus, Ohio. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> how, how does the need to explain that make a difference in your surgical risk assessment? Um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily. I don't care about the anatomy of it. I care about the person. If he's frail, not frail, COPD, not COPD, renal failure, not renal failure, that CT doesn't affect me because his aorta is not porcelain. That's the only thing I care about. But, but the scarring of the valve in place for six years, bother. you're okay with that? And can I tell you, this will be easy to take out. You want me to tell you why? He's got a PVL. Oh. And so it won't be an issue. He's not SVD where he's grown into it. PVL, you scoop it, you put something in. You, but look, you, at that, look at that CT. It looks like the whole thing's like embedded into the aorta. Okay. And it, it's actually, you know, because it's, okay. it's lower, you, you may have a little bit more impingement on the anterior mitral valve leaflet, so that may be the concern, if anything. It, it's not sticking up high in the aorta, so it makes it actually relatively easy, as we know said. And Steve, you just patch those mitral yeah. valves if you have to. Okay. Hey, David, how do you deal with PVL and intravalvular PV? Uh, I mean, I would, I mean, I don't know any other way, I mean, other than surgery, which I don't think this guy, I mean, if he was high risk six years ago, he didn't get lower risk probably, um, uh, you know, <laughs> other than putting a, you know, putting a nice low uh, sapien in and overexpanding it to, to try to treat the PVL as well. I mean, so that, I mean, because that's, if you had a lot of PVL at the time when you put a core valve in and you now acutely, you'd be looking to put a sapien in to, you know, to treat it immediately. And so I'd be looking to put a sapien in. Steve, yeah. remember you have two cases, so you better yeah. I know, I know, I know. So, and plus I have questions. So, okay, so how do you solve intravalvular? And that's, I think we got to that. What device should be used? Sapien, is that what you said? It was a 29 before, right? Yeah. Yes, I think the key is to know where is the PVL is above the skirt. I don't know if there's a skirt at that time. Um, six years ago, probably not. 
it's pretty it's pretty low. So I think you can put the valve higher with a sapien, and you're gonna seal everything. Well, um, but Philippe, it, well, you'd put it to the, where the native annulus is. Not don't the care about annulus. where the core valve is, yeah. but where the native annulus. Yeah, it depends where's the valve now, and where what is the origin of the PVL? You know, so that's yeah, if it's above the. Okay, and do you protect the coronaries? Adnan. Yeah, I mean, it's so uh, we we didn't see that part of the CT, but that's the worry, and. Um, so, in terms of, uh, you know, protecting the coronaries, the lower implant is going to be better. Um, in terms of sealing the PVL, uh, maybe as Philippe suggested, the higher implant will be better. Um, so, uh, uh, we, we, you know, we didn't see the VTCs and the, those there, kind of things. There, the core valve's like right up against the uh, coronaries. Can we see the angiography again? Do you no. Want orthography? <laughs> <laughs> it's not... <laughs> Do you, do you not do Just, CTs uh, when you plan these procedures, Steve? Yeah. Say again. Another CT. Let's go back. What? To that. Uh -huh. What'd you say? We're just going to see the CT. <laughs> Where's the damn corner? There it is. Calcified. Yeah. So, but actually, we, here the we, point we, is that for me, it's important to understand the risk plane of the first valve. If the valve is deeper in the ventricle, actually, you may stay below the coronary artery. So, this is a very important point yeah. to understand if the commissure stay below the coronaries. If you stay like that, you can go without protection with the Sabian in core valve. What about unicorn? Unicorn. I, I've never done you. Well, you go ahead and tell me about what's. Yeah, tell us yeah this, there was a case presentation recently that described uh, basically doing uh, a TAVR deployment in the pre-existing prosthesis leaflet. So you've effectively pushed it out of the way and split it and yeah. taken it out of the so equation. Like, oh, of yeah. It's like Batman. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Steve, keep okay, going. I'll keep going. So anyway, um, we, we planned this CT. We did coronary protection of both coronary arteries. This valve, uh, Carlos is back here. He showed me on the CT. We could land this sapien valve anywhere we wanted to. We didn't have to be at the bottom. We could have been up. We could be anywhere we wanted to um, with these coronaries. And here's what the, uh, the valve delivery looked like. And then we got the... Uh, I think those are out of order, but the valve went in uh, well. It was at the bat, and that worked out fine. Okay, so I guess the point of that is that the protection of the coronaries can or cannot be done. I thought it was important. We decided to do it on that case. So, 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 so what, was the, what was the hemodynamics when you were done, though? Because your, your sapien was at the annular level, right, so you're yeah, going to have leaflet four, overhang. I think he was 14 yeah. at the end. Okay. His, and, so, and, the, and the PVL went away? Because you had PVL, all PVL. And, and central. I, yeah, you all crushed PBL the PL went too. away. This is what that was his. Uh, That's the next patient. Yeah, go, go back. Twenty six sapien inside there. All PVL went away, and, um, and that was his follow up echo. I'm not sure why they're go not up, playing. Go back one more, and then go forward and see if yeah. you can play it. Then now go forward. There you go. I mean, it seems like you were, and this is understandable. Well, you're accepting some leaflet overhang so that you can basically mitigate the risk of coronary obstruction there, right? And because if you didn't have any leaflet overhang, then protecting the coronaries isn't going to do anything anyhow, right? You're probably not going to be able to stent that leaflet out of the way unless there's some yeah. pliability and, and to it. I'm sure that someone will talk about that, but I don't know how. I'm not always convinced that in valves that are six years old, leaflet overhang is something we have to really yeah, think about. Yeah, I agree with that. Where's Jannar? Is Jannar here? Uh, Back I there. Was, I was going to ask Jannar. <laughs> we, we would have done Dossi I'm, simulations and comp. Jannar, you're the leaflet yeah. overhang guy. Yeah, let's go, Jannar. Come save me. Let's get over here. So do you think okay. in a six-year-old valve that even matters? Um, yeah, so look, you know, as a general gestalt, uh, there is no biological state in the body where you have leaflet overhang, right? So it's not a situation that is ideal, but this is a compromised state that we're dealing with. When we looked at this on the bench, the first point is that we use new valves, so they behave like something like AI. So it's not something that's necessarily like a stenotic valve. That being said, we've just done some testing and degenerated valves that are stiff. Um, and the nice thing is it's you don't get much of that diastolic backflow. So it actually kind of stays sort of stiff. What we don't know, and it's very hard to test, is what is the impact on flow when you have overhanging leaflets? So there is for sure going to be some impact in terms of turbulence. And you're not going to get nice laminar flow. Now, 
84, high risk. Sounds like the only person in the room that would touch her is Vino, but you know. I said, <laughs> I said Tav and Tav first. <laughs> but you know, that's a very reasonable option. So I think we would just accept that. Now the question for you, Steve, and for Carlos, is what did you guys do with the anticoagulation for her? So quick answer to that, right? Because you have another case and we still yeah, have more Yeah, I, I don't know the right answer to that. We always put everybody on a couple of months of, an, of uh, anticoagulation with like eloquence, but nobody, I don't know what to do there. I wish you wouldn't answer, ask me tough questions. Remember, I'm going on the offensive here. 74-year-old man with severe symptomatic uh, AS, 100-pack year smoker, moderate PVD, no alternative access, no alternative access. And so we are undaunted. So here's his peripheral vasculature. You can see that they're kind of tiny on the right. They look a little bit better on the left. Um, would you do this, David? Would you go up the leg? Please. Left looks OK. Left looks OK. I mean, I, it, graph, there's calcium. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd be willing to try it, but I'd probably want to use like a, you know, make sure I can get a sheath up before I do anything else. And I'm, I'm always still surprised. I mean, the carotids really were not acceptable. Yeah, where's the other half of the body, Steve? Yeah, I mean, because you never. No, I don't believe you. But that, you know, they were, they were. the order doesn't look that bad either. Transapical. <laughs> no, directly. Like, <laughs> okay. All right. So the the sheath was easy. Um, the delivery catheter was difficult. I had to push. Mm -hmm. And you might see this little guy up here oh, wow. that may not belong. You see that guy that's sticking out, giving you the finger, David? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. Wow. You guys see that? Do you see what he's talking about? Yeah. I don't, is there a pointer on this? There's thing? a laser pointer on it. Yeah. If you, is there a, oh, yeah, right. Oh, there, there This yeah. guy. So now this is in the aorta. Vino, what, are you, what do you do now? Because the surgeons in the room usually panic at this point. The cardiologist. It's, it's a hook, so it won't come but it's out going of the, in the wrong. Yeah, it's, it's in a favorable trajectory. The hook is not pointing. <laughs> yeah. You know. it's, it's, just don't go back. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't take There's only one way now. Yeah. Type B dissections are OK. <laughs> <laughs> Medically manage them. <laughs> Ethan, what would you do? Well, I mean, you've come this far. It's not going to come out easily. My temptation would be to implant the valve and to hope that when you expand the valve, it will just sort of straighten and take a more normal configuration. But it's going to be, I, I, I would sweat going up and around the arch. Yeah, well, our surgeons were sweating. They said, you got to get this thing yeah. out. I said, there's no getting this thing out, right? You can't get it out. It's yeah. impossible. Not to but, well, you can. Hot. Get not it out. Not to the femoral artery, you're not. Not to the femoral artery. <laughs> It'll be done with the case, probably, but. Yeah. yeah keep right. pushing. So remove the valve, deploy the valve. Sounds like everybody wants to deploy the valve. So this is the valve. It's still like <laughs> staring at you. And then it disappears wow. a little, but it's still ne there. Never seen and, it. And then it goes up, and it didn't do anything to the annulus. It just, everything was. So just, I, I, I walked out for a second, and it looked like you had a valve with a hook. Yeah, yeah that's right. So I probably so, pushed the time yeah. back as we're going through. The so what about just de deploying it and then descending? Well, do you think that's worse than in the annulus? Well, I mean, I'm just thinking that you could gently deploy it at a relatively low pressure and just leave it there. I mean, then, I mean, because I, 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 I think you have to, if you deploy it in the native aortic valve, you're committed to a high pressure deployment, which could risk injury. Risk injury. But in the descending order, I think it would be safer. I mean, Vino just said type Bs are fine. They are. So I, I was worried about, I think the only thing that occurred to me was number one, I couldn't, I'm not going to get this out no matter right. what. You're not getting it number out. Number two you're is, um, do I want to consider perfing the aorta or perfing the well, annulus? Well, the nice thing is that if you perf the aorta, you could put a covered stent or you know something endovascular and take care of it that way. But if you perf the native aortic valve, that's a surgical emergency. Yeah, yeah I mean, so, that's at the very distal end, right? So you'd be somewhere in the LVOT, right? right? Because, you know, and, I mean, Steve said, can you save me here? The, um, <laughs> the, right? I mean, I just, I don't know. I mean, these kind of 
things happen. We deploy through this kind of crap all the time. I think we don't notice it half the time, probably, for some of these things. I, I, I guess I just, looking at that, I mean, it's a, you know, the hook looks bad, and it looks like I wouldn't want to drag it back, but I just wouldn't be that worried about deploying it in the native, I mean, the valve's calcified, it's a mess, and, uh, you know, it's not protruding very far, and it's probably going to flatten down. It's probably going to, I don't, I guess I just wouldn't have been Nearly I, I, as worried as the, the you know, some yeah. people, I suppose. I, I, mean, I think I guess an analogy, I'm just more worried about taking it around the arch than anything else. But it was bent that. backwards. It was, I mean, it was, I, I think it was, it, I mean, the, uh, I don't, did you just, I mean, at least Philippe, to me, I wouldn't have been all that worried about that yeah. either. Philippe, I don't know. What, Philippe, what would you have done? Uh, I think if you max, so if you maximally flex and you go slow and you don't have uh, resistance, you're fine. You know, it's, you really do a no touch technique, which you just, Put, pull the wire and flex and go very slow. Make sure you don't touch the wall. I think I would have done the same thing that you did. Yeah, I would, so how many in the room would have deployed it in the descending? Raise your hand. How many in the room would have just, a um, couple of people, how many in the room would have just done what, what Steve did? What are your final results, man? It was perfect. I okay. think we should do this, I think we should do this more often. <laughs> Actually, it worked great. And, uh, and you can see that little this could be a solution for yeah. this could be a solution for AI. You just need to come up with an acronym for the modification. <laughs> That's awesome, Steve. All right, thank Be you. better lucky than good. Is Rahul is Rahul here? I haven't seen him. There he is. Oh, okay. Here we go. Different role. <laughs> All right, good morning everybody, thanks for having me. Thank you, Paul and the course directors. So I was tasked to talk about a new technical discovery and uh, so this is what, uh, this is a case from a few years ago that I found to be very educationally enriching and so, and since then it's paid a lot of dividends in other scenarios as well. These are my disclosures. So we have a 70 year old female, she reports a history of a murmur for years, she's referred by her cardiologist to me for echo findings of severe AS, class 3 heart failure symptoms and class 4 accelerated angina. No prior coronary or cardiac history, but she does have multiple atherosclerotic risk factors. Um, so in the interest of time, I won't go through all of her pre-procedural imaging, but I'll just summarize and say she had critical AS, valve area was 0.26, her peak and mean gradients were probably amongst the highest I've ever seen, 170 peak gradient, 91 mean gradient, some mild aortic regurgitation, preserved EF, coronary angiogram uh, did not show any significant coronary disease, and her CT TAVI scan showed an aortic valve calcium score greater than 5,000 with uh, morphology of the leaflets consistent with a Seaver zero bicuspid. Just a couple of CT images, you can see her aortic valve, the degree of calcification. There's also a significant spicule of calcium at the level of the annulus on the image on the right. And these are my measurements. I always measure um, my own CTs before my cases, and you can see the major and minor axis of the valve as well as the perimeter in the area. Perimeter of 71.6, area of 392. And for this case, it'd be interested to see what the panel thinks. I, I chose a self-expanding valve for this case. Um, given the uh, calcification level of the annulus, uh, is that what you all would have done? So, this? so, so time out for a second. Let's, <laughs> let's not talk about Tara. Who, who would have sent this patient for surgery first? Knows okay. how to skip so over. So let's not talk about Tavra valves right now. <laughs> okay. So I know we're in a cardiology meeting, right, Paul? But I, I mean, there's like two surgeons in the room so here. I, I mean, so, so yeah. So let's just go down. The, I'm just curious from the panel, Adnan. So let's start with you, Adnan. We'll start with you. We're going to go all six of us here. Who would have sent this patient to surgery? The age. We don't know the age. 70 years old. 70 low years risk old. patient, right? Because I looked at yeah, all the comorbidities. So the, he heavily calcified uh, bicuspid valve with a calcified raphe, um, that nodule of, you know, um, calcium at the annulus. So it would make me nervous. I would, I would ask my surgeon if they can operate. Just surgeon. So you're going to say surgery. Okay. Giuseppe. Yes, yes, I agree. The surgeon. Surgery. Uh, surgery, no question. Surgery. Ethan? Ethan, we would, what would, we you would do? have done DASI simulations, and if DASI simulations showed us a high level, we would have done uh, surgery. If not, we would have done tavern. I'm being you, honest with you. Yeah, why yeah. Did you do great. Why so did you, this, was, this was a very uh, spirited discussion amongst our valve team and the patient. Um, the patient was the spouse of a physician in our group. They came to us very clearly uh, and said, we want a TAVR. 
I showed them so literally. Was so so you guys Brady? even do Kevin that to Brady? your own, huh? I, I, sh yeah. the I showed them PowerPoint slides of data from <laughs> registry data and embedded <laughs> nested to their own, you know. <laughs> of outcomes of bicuspid, um, the data from the Cedars group, calcified rafies, all the stuff that you know we all can think about. But it was very clear. They wanted a TAVR, and this is what I gave them. I mean, uh, type zero bicuspid, I mean, enthusiasm for this. I mean, I, it's just zero. Zero. <laughs> so yeah, but exactly. And uh, I was heavily on the side of pushing for surgery, heavily. So uh, I chose a self-expanding valve for this case. Uh, coronary heights look good. Uh, and as I mentioned, the angiogram showed no significant coronary disease either. Very calcified valve apparatus. We did not have uh, uh, coronary uh, embolic protection devices on our shelf at the time that this case was done a few years ago. So the clinical challenge in this case was simple. We started this case that I felt should have been done surgically with bifemoral right-sided transfemoral TAVR access. Preclosed the right common femoral, all the stuff that we're all used to. I crossed the aortic valve. Initially, I tried to cross with a five French AR4. Uh, it wouldn't go. Then I moved to a four French AL1. I, got, I, I was able to cross. I exchanged for a five French pigtail. I did a pre BAV as I would with most bicuspid cases. I used an 18 millimeter balloon. And I'm doing this through the Gore dry seal sheath. Then exchanged for the Medtronic Evolute 26 through the inline sheath system. It would have been a 26 self expanding versus a 23 balloon expandable given her dimensions. So I went with a self expanding valve. I could not get the valve to cross despite having pre BAV'd. And so at that point, I went through all the things I normally do in this scenario. I did another pre uh, BAV, this time with a slightly larger balloon. It still wouldn't cross. And at the same time, I switched to a stiffer curved Lundy, wouldn't cross. I did the buddy wire from the left common femoral, wouldn't cross. I could not get this valve to cross. And so this is the point at which I looked at everyone in the room and I said, see, I told you this patient should have had surgery. <laughs> when did, Any comments at this point before I yes. tell you what I did? Yes, I have one comment there. From above. Exactly. Okay. So actually, and one, from below. <laughs> Giuseppe, yeah. I have one comment. Actually, this happened when you go with this stiff valve system because you have two spine within the delivery system. Actually, the Rafi here is at 10 o'clock. So it's exactly where you have to get in into the ventricle. So in this case, what we do is to go with a balloon there, a par a barrel balloon, a parallel balloon there to inflate, let's say, four millimeter body mercury. Balloon. Not by body balloon. You inflate the balloon into the ventricle, just pull it up, and then you go down with the valve easily. This is the... We so would, we would use a Giuseppe, 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 would you not be worried about a stroke doing that, man? No, because I do not inflate too much. So actually, I just inflate a little bit the balloon to have a, you know, a second a sliding effect into the ventricle. To be Nick, it's, very, it's very simple. Huh? Yeah, Nick? I was just going to say, I feel your pain. I was in this scenario, not a surgical candidate, uh, like two weeks ago. Uh, it was absolutely painful. Unfortunately, my buddy balloon also did not help me. Yeah. Um, but I think what Paul was saying over here is sometimes a snare from the inner curve around your wire might be able to help pull right. you similarly, so, you know, across that comma sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this, the, at this point, and I, I always kind of say this to myself is no matter what type of procedure we're doing, whether it's coronary structural peripheral, an algorithmic approach and moving seamlessly from one step to the next is important. Uh, and so in the interest of time, let me tell you guys what I did next. So I did something which at that time was the very first time I had done it. This was maybe about three, four years ago, which was to dare to snare. So I took a lot of time to come up with that. So, um, so outlining all the steps and words on a slide didn't seem very entertaining to me. So I'm just going to show you what I did. But I basically exchanged out my pigtail on the left for a JR4 guide and a 25 millimeter gooseneck snare. And what I learned live in the midst of this case is that the snare has to be positioned in a specific conformation with the guide side of it on the outer curve so that the valve can ride the outer curve, which is what it had been doing. And so now you see the Evolute valve going through the snare. And at this point, you can see I'm going to lock down the snare on the spine of the valve by pushing the guide forward and pulling the snare back. And now me, together with my co-surgeon, pair, uh, two pairs of hands are moving around the arch of the aorta together. And when I came down to the level of the root, you're going to appreciate in the next few seconds the dramatic 
amount of pulling and counter-traction that I had to apply to centralize this valve. And you're going to see a separation between my guide and snare to the inner curve and the valve, which is riding the outer curve, basically outlining on fluoro the actual diameter of the arch. Dramatic amount of pulling until it finally popped across. Ro Raul, can you go back to how you snared this again? Yeah. Did you so, take everything out of the ventricle and start again? I'm gonna, and I'm going to outline those steps in just a moment. Absolutely. So you see the valve pops across three, two, one. So it's across. And at this point, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Now you remember, loosen your snare. Loosen it, bring it all the way up past the distal capsule. And we went ahead and deployed the valve. Then the valve appears constrained. It does not appear fully expanded. And you're probably wondering where that pigtail come from, so I'm going to answer all this. So final images, I went ahead and post-dilated with a 22 millimeter true balloon. It expanded pretty decently. And you see there's a conclusion shot there on the right. I don't see any significant PVL, and the gradients were 12 the next day on the echo. No PVL. She went home post-op day one. She's greater than two years, actually greater than three and a half years post-op and still doing well, and I'm in touch with uh, her husband, so I know she's doing well. So the key points. An algorithmic approach, you encounter a problem, whether it's in a case that you really didn't think should have been done anyway, but you encounter a problem and you want to move from one step to the next uh, as safely as you can, be prepared and comfortable to try something new. This was my per first time personally using this snare technique a few years ago. And since then, I've used it time after time and it has been very rewarding and safe. But at that, at that moment, it was something very new and very unsettling. And then snares can allow for tremendous counter-traction and navigation of complex anatomic angles. Um, and it allowed us to complete this case safely. Uh, even if uh, I did resent being in the situation to begin with. So um, these are, I think, the key learning points. Now, to answer Steve's question, there are two ways to do this. And since doing this case, I've done it in a way that I think is safer. But the way that I did it on this particular day, which was my first time, was maybe a little bit risky. What I did was I forfeited LV access, removed my wire, everything. So now I've just got a gore dry seal in the right um, common femoral and I've got my six French sheath in the left common femoral. I went ahead and inserted the JR4 guide with the snare, 25, mil mil 25 millimeter gooseneck snare in the left. I recrossed the aortic valve with the four French AL1 and a straight wire by doing it all through the snare. And then the whole circuit follows. I deployed this valve without a pigtail in the root but with my eyes looking exactly at the calcium at the level of what I knew where the annulus was based on the previous root angiogram, and my eyes were honed in on that and literally deployed the valve at where I thought the annulus was because of all the time I'd spent looking at it you know, for the first 45 minutes before we moved to the snare technique. I would not do that today, but that's how I deployed this valve. What I would do today and what I have done since then is get a four French access in the left common femoral with the six French sheaths, so two sheets in the left common femoral artery, and put a four French pigtail in the root. The six French R4 guide is through the six French left femoral sheath, and then I can take hand injections with a four French pigtail in the root until I deploy the valve, and then I can lose the snare, the guide, go back, you know, and, and go ahead and have a six French pigtail and do any post dilatation or whatever is necessary. So I would get accessory access if I were to do this case today and what I've done since this case. But at the time of this case, I did all, it did all, all of it basically by eye based on where I knew the root was and where the calcification was. Well, can I ask, so if you've been doing this for several years now. Have you done it with the FX system? And I have you? So that's, that's a great question. Yeah. I, have, I have been so, and I, full disclosure, I'm a pretty, uh, equal user, if anything, maybe more balloon expandable. I've been very impressed with the trackability of the FX. But have you noticed the counter traction to be different? When I you have not it? had to okay. do this technique with a single FX yeah. case. With the different, different splines, I would expect right. you would not have to pull that hard, but you have to, 
when I first did this, you have to pull much harder than you think. Yeah. And it's oh, really yeah. uncomfortable. And your your view there where you're on the inner curve of the aorta, right. it is really uncomfortable. And those that have done this know that that was a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. So actually a short comment, a short comment. So this case is very interesting, not because of bicuspid aorta that was not crossable, because this is a combination of two things, that is bicuspid aorta and the extremely severe horizontal aorta. And actually in the previous studies, uh, bicuspid and extreme angle or horizontal were excluded. So we don't have data in this regard. Yeah. But probably one of the most important takeaways is that not all the say the, the system are the same for this kind of case. For instance, with Sabian, with the commander, you can change the angulation. This might simplify your life. And there are other self-expandable systems like the Namitor that I know that you don't use it here in the US, but actually you don't have spine within the delivery. It's very slippery. So the point is to consider all these things before taking the final decision on the final system to use. I mean, this lady, Vinci, is, you know, I mean, I, I think it's a great result. Congratulations. I do think that at the end of the day, I mean, she'll probably need another valve done, right? I mean, she's 70, so she should need something done. Uh, yeah, I still think that if at the end of the day, if you think that surgery is the right thing for a patient, you can't alter yeah. what you think is right for the patient. Right. Because somebody's giving you pressure for that. I yeah, think, and I, I think I think that that's something that still Giuseppe that we have to mention, right? I mean, yeah. um, I think that's important. You know, um, you're right. Nobody wants surgery. I don't want surgery, but if I think it's the right thing to do, then we have to consider that. That patient gets a 25 valve and at age 80, they get a taver and a saber, and they're done for the rest of their life. So yeah, and I, I just want to I want to mention that to the crowd. I, I, absolutely, we've I, all done these cases, yeah, but absolutely. we have to be careful on oh yeah not giving in to what we don't think is the right thing yeah. to do. And, I, and I, I, I vividly remember all the comments and emphatic comments I made about how I would never find myself in a case like this because I am a very strict interpretationist. And here, here you are, yeah. Right, yeah, there you go. That, that was a great. Thank you all. That was a great illustration. And anyone close it out? Uh, yeah, we're closing it out. <laughs>